True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to another episode of True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Moreno, and on today's episode, we cover the freeway killer, William Bonin. He's an American serial killer, twice-paroled sex offender who committed the rape, torture, murder of at least 21 boys and young men between 1979 and 1980 in Southern California. Oddly enough, he shares the title of the freeway killer with two other men, and they're all around the same time. So the first one was Patrick Kearney, who, com- who comes just before him, and then William Bonin, and then Randy Kraft, who's arrested only three years after Bonin. So in that small window of time, there were three freeway killers. What was going on in that time and place? It's crazy town. My sources for this story are Wikipedia, Murderpedia, CriminalMinds.com, and MurderTown.com. Okay, without further ado, let's jump right in to the disgusting murder spree that was William Bonin, a.k.a. the Freeway Killer. It's March 1980. And the house party is winding down, and people are slowly starting to leave. There's beer bottles everywhere, and William Bonin is buzzed and horny. A bad combination for this guy. He looked around the room to see who was left. There's a guy across the room who had to be in his mid-30s. No, too old. But wait, who is that over there? Sitting in a chair, obviously wasted, a teenager by himself. Bonin approaches the boy. Hey, what's up? Have a good time? Yeah, it was rad, was the answer. I was leaving. Do you want to ride home? Yeah, man, that'd be great. So the two men head for the door, saying bye to people on their way out. They get in the van, parked in the driveway, and pull out. They barely make it a block when Bonin turns to the boy and asks him if he wants to have sex. The teen looks at him, doesn't know what to say, doesn't like the vibe. At the stoplight, he reaches for the door handle. But there isn't one on the passenger side of the van. Bonin grabs him by the collar. You're not going anywhere. Get comfortable and the van pulls away from the light. He continues, Look, I get it. You don't want to have sex. I just get so horny, you know. I can't control myself. I like to pick up young boys on the weekends, bind them up, rape them, and strangle them to death. Yeah, right, man, (laughs) said the teenager, not believing what he was hearing. No, it's true. And listen, if you want to kill somebody, you should make a plan. Find a place to dump the body before you even pick a victim. You look shocked. Did I say something shocking? It's okay. You're safe. Too many people saw us leaving the party tonight. I won't attack you. Bonin turns up the boy's street and drops him off at home. Who is this man that picks up young boys for his pleasure and ends their lives? His name was William George Bonin. He's born in Willimantic, Connecticut on January 8, 1947. He's one of three sons born to Robert and Alice. Both his parents are alcoholics, his father a compulsive gambler who physically abused his wife and children. The kids are neglected by the parents and the neighbors step in to feed and clothe them. The three boys are often left with their maternal grandfather who, of course, had sexually abused his own daughter and now he moved on to his grandsons. Like, if you're the mother, I get you're an alcoholic and you have addiction issues, I mean, there must be moments of clarity where you're like, oh, wait, my father abused me. I'm not going to put my sons. It's so gross. Okay. Needless to say, the mother snaps the fuck out of it eventually. Maybe she just got sober one day and places the boys in an orphanage in 1953. Unfortunately for them, this place is straight out of American Horror Story. The freaks that are running the shit show administer severe beatings. The children endure stress positions like they would make them pose in these positions that were like super stressful and that they would be shaking and sweating it would be hurting their bodies um and then partial drowning in sinks for breaches of conduct so bonin would later tell investigators that he consented to the sexual advances of older males at the orphanage if they tied his hands behind his back it was like he's a child and they're coming at him with these like sexual advances and he's saying okay you can but make sure you tie my hands behind my back so even at this age he's equating sex with violence and bondage or binding immobilizing he stays there in the orphanage until he's nine and then he goes back to live with his terrible 
terrible parents. I mean, which is worse? This reminds me of Aileen Warnos, the damsel of death. Remember, her childhood was just abuse after abuse. No matter where she went, she was abused. It's like abuse just follows these people around. At 10 years old, Bonin is arrested for stealing license plates, and he's put in juvie where the sexual abuse continues. He's repeatedly physically and sexually abused by several people, including his adult counselor. Four years later, the family is facing foreclosure, and they decide to move out west to California. They find a house in Downey, which is not far from Compton, if you know where that is. And thankfully, his father dies from cirrhosis of the liver shortly after. So, you can move, but you know, wherever you go, there you are. So the troubles follow them, no matter where they are. And a teenage Bonin turns from victim to predator. He molests his younger brother... And he lures neighborhood children into his house with the promise of booze where he sexually assaults them. All of his victims are younger than he is. And during this time, he commits robbery, petty theft, and grand theft. So, again, again, the crossroads. It's kind of like if he had had therapy, if he had had support, if he had had, I mean, if his mother was not an alcoholic, if you know, all of these external factors all sort of building to this making this person into a monster. So by now it's obvious that he's gay. He knows it. Everyone knows it. And in an attempt to quash his gayness, though, Bonin's mother encourages her son to get engaged. I mean, this is like mother of the year award goes to her for sure. Um, So straight out of high school, he gets engaged in 1965. So he's engaged. Then it's time for the Vietnam War. So he joins the U.S. Air Force, where he gets a medal when he's there in recognition for his gallantry when he risks his life to save a fellow airman, which sounds nice. However, the war also teaches him that human life is overvalued. And of course, he takes the opportunity to have not only consensual sex, but sexually assaulting at least two fellow soldiers at gunpoint. Obviously, these were like young people, but if you're sexually assaulting somebody at gunpoint and you're in the army, wasn't wasn't anybody reported that? Or they were just tried to forget it, maybe? Yeah. Also, war. I mean, it's bound to do that. I mean, it's going to desensitize you to death. It has to, it must, right? I mean, you're there. Imagine you're on the battlefield. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Um, I don't have that in me, but you're on the battlefield. There's the enemy and quote unquote, it's just another human being. And then you're just killing them. You kill one, you kill two, you kill 10, you blow up a whole bunch. I mean, it just becomes, you become desensitized, obviously. Um, He serves a total of three years, and upon his discharge, he goes back to live with his mom, at which point he marries his fiance. But they divorce like two seconds later, so that does not last. Okay, let's move on to his convictions. So they start early. On November 17th, 1968, he's only 21 years old, and Bonin commits a sexual assault on a youth over the next four months, does it three more times with boys aged 12 to 18. In each case, he binds the hands, he engaged in sodomy, oral copulation, bludgeoning, and squeezing the testicles. So already he's sort of got his uh, MO down. The next year, in 1969, as he attempts to do the same to a 16-year-old that he lured into his vehicle, he's caught red-handed and is indicted on five counts of kidnapping, four counts of sodomy, one count of oral copulation, one count of child molestation of the five youths that he had abducted earlier. So he doesn't get away with it, but he pleads guilty and he's sentenced to the Atascadero State Hospital as a mentally disordered sexual offender who they thought could be cured by treatment. Remember, this is January 1971. While he's there, Bonin undergoes a bunch of psychiatric exams that reveal he's smarter than the average Joe with an IQ of 120, which goes to show you, okay, people are like, you're stupid. Okay, well, that's okay. I'm not a child molester. I mean, I'm not saying if you're smart, you're a child molester. I'm just saying like IQ doesn't mean and it doesn't mean you're a good person. Why am I getting so worked up about this? I think I'm smart. Anyway. And he suffers from manic depression, and he has damage to his prefrontal cortex of the brain, which reduces a person's ability to restrain violent impulses. So this guy is basically the perfect storm for something to go wrong. They find scars on his head and his ass, which are likely the abuse from the orphanage. He claims that he doesn't know, 
Probably he just doesn't want to talk about it. Two years after his arrival at the Atascadero State Hospital, Bonin is sent to prison. He's declared unsuitable for further treatment, mostly because he keeps trying to force fellow male inmates to have sex with him. Talk about somebody who has zero uh, impulse control. This, I mean, he was caught having done all of these things to these young boys. They take him to a psychiatric hospital for treatment, thinking, oh, okay, we can cure him for, of his illness. And then he can't even help himself there while he's under treatment. He's like molesting people and coming on to people and forcing people to have sex with him and stuff. Like, uh, if you're smart, okay, we just covered the fact that you have a high IQ of 121, which obviously doesn't supersede your impulse to do these horrible things. Because if you were, if your intelligence was bigger than your desires to do these things, then you would know being in the, in the hospital, hey, I just have to behave myself and they're going to let me go. I'll just pretend I'm cured and then I can go out and do whatever I want again. But no, they sent him to prison. But not for long, because on June 11th, 1974, he's released from prison after doctors concluded he was, quote, no longer a danger to, to the health and safety of others, end quote. <laughs> I mean... Hindsight is twenty twenty, but I don't even think you needed hindsight there. I mean, he was molesting people at the hospital after he was brought in for abducting and molesting and raping all those boys. And then they're like, quote, he's no longer a danger to the health and safety of others. All fixed. <laughs> we We did it, guys. Congratulations. Gold star. We fixed him. All right. So he had a bunch of other offenses and imprisonment. Um including the including the same year Bonin meets a 14-year-old named David Allen McVicker on September 8, 1974. David is hitchhiking and he's heading to his parents' place in Huntington Beach. He accepts a ride from Bonin. Okay. So we have to remember that this is right now this is the so it's 1974, so it's like the mid 70s. Hitchhiking was a thing. People would do it. People got places by hitchhiking. Nobody really thought about serial killers or stranger danger or anything like that. So hitchhiking is rampant in this story. It was normal for the time and place. Obviously, for stories like because of stories like this, hitchhiking is no longer a thing. It's not a safe thing and not advisable. Please don't hitchhike. Anyone, please. So he accepts a ride. David gets in. Bonin steps on the gas. He asks if he's gay. David doesn't like this question, and he asks to be let out of the van. He was probably really polite about it, too. Like, oh, um, could you just let me out? Thank you. Uh, Bonin takes out a gun, and he, drives, uh, and he drives the van to a deserted field where he makes the boy undress at gunpoint. He beats and rapes him and starts strangling him with his own T-shirt. The boy is screaming, and Bonin stops what he's doing. He apologizes. He gets back in the van, and he drives the boy to his parents' house. Like, what? the fuck just happened so he completely i mean he raped him he beat him he was strangling him to death but there was a point somewhere in his brain where that stopped him this this would have been his first murder but something stopped him like there i guess once you cross that threshold then it's easy to throw well Actually, Bonin does mention that. After you, you do your first kill, your second one, it just gets easier and easier. So he had not done a kill yet. So anyway, he stopped what he was doing, and he drops the guy off at his parents' house. He pulls into the driveway, and he says, quote, we'll meet again, end quote. Like, did he not think that the kid was going to go to the police or tell his parents? So, of course, he did. So David tells his mom, she calls the police, and Bonin is charged with rape. And he's also charged with the attempted abduction of a 15-year-old two days after the David incident. So, like, he tried with David. It didn't really go well. He drops him off. I'll see you again. Two days later, he's on to a 15-year-old. He offered the 15-year-old cash for sex. The 15-year-old refused, and Bonin tries to run over the boy with his van. He doesn't quite have it down yet, but he's getting there. So, anyway, he pleads guilty, and on December 31st, 1975... He's sentenced to 1 to 15 years in jail. I mean, that's a big, like 1 to 15 years? Why, why, that's a big, that's a big spread of years. But of course, he's released on October 11th, 1978, about two years later, with 18 months supervised probation. So he gets a slap on the wrist. This guy is a total mama's boy, by the way. Also, because when he's released, he moves into an apartment one mile from his mama's house. 
because he doesn't want to be far. Uh, he gets work as a truck driver. I mean, what a great cover for him, a truck driver. I mean, they're always on the road. He gets a reputation for being super friendly with the neighborhood teenage boys, obviously, allowing them to drink and socialize at his place. He also allegedly dates a woman around this time, which is weird. I, I assume it was just using her as a beard, like as a cover. Bonin gets to know one of his neighbors really well, who throws regular parties at his place. And it's at one of these parties that Bonin meets 21-year-old Vernon Butts, like your last name is Butts, and 18-year-old Gregory Miley. Butts is a part-time magician fascinated with the occult, and Miley is an illiterate Texan with a low IQ. <laughs> so, sounds like two winners. These two morons will go on to assist Bonin in his freeway murder spree. Assist him. Yes, that's right. He was bringing people in to help him with the murders. This guy must have been super charismatic, like kind of like a cult leader, like somebody who can bring people in and then convince them to do things with them. What did he say to them to convince them to join him? We'll never know. Bonin gets himself a Ford Econoline van. It's an olive green and his MO is as follows. He keeps his eyes peeled for young male hitchhikers, schoolboys, or male prostitutes. Victims are typically aged 12 to 19 and are either lured or forced into his van where he over... I mean, 12? I mean, 19 is young too, but fucking 12? Ugh. Um, he lures them into his van. He overpowers them. He binds them, handcuffs them with wires and cords. He sexually assaults them, beats them around the head and genitals, and tortures them before strangling them, usually with their own t-shirt. Um, some are stabbed to death. Some are beaten to death. One victim was forced to drink hydrochloric acid. Three others had ice pick drilled into their ears, and another one died of shock. He's a monster. So to stop any potential escapes from the van, Bonin removes the handles from the inside of the doors and stows his tools close by. These include ligatures, knives, and household tools. The victims are typically killed inside the van with their bodies discarded along or close to the freeways in Southern California. His cohorts, Butts and Miley, would be implicated in a lot of the murders. They are two of his accomplices, but not the only ones, as we'll see. On May 28th, 1979, 13-year-old Thomas Glenn Ludgren leaves his parents' house in Reseda at 10.50 a.m. Bonin, with the help of Vernon Butts, abducts the boy. That same afternoon, his body is found in Agora with only a t-shirt, shoes, and socks. An autopsy shows that Thomas had been emasculated and bludgeoned, stabbed, and strangled. Two months later, on August 4th, 1979, Bonin and Butts abduct a 17-year-old named Mark Shelton who was walking to a movie theater near Beach Boulevard. Neighbors report that they hear screams. Mark was violated with foreign objects, including a pool cue, and he dies of shock. His body is found in San Bernardino County. That same month, Bonin and Butts accost West German student Marcus Grabs, a 17-year-old, on a backpacking tour of the U.S., who's hitchhiking on the Pacific Coast Highway. That always makes me sad, too, to think that when there's, like, a tourist that goes somewhere and they're like, like, did you watch The Serpent on Netflix? And, you know, it's like these tourists that go to these places with all these big dreams and big ideas and they're out for adventure and a good time and they just meet this kind of fate. I mean, it's just hideous. Um, Marcus is tied up and brought to Bonin's place where he's sodomized, beaten, and stabbed. His naked body is found the next day in Malibu Creek. Okay. So there's a lot of murders that happen now, and they're all kind of consecutive because he did all of his murdering in a small window of time. So it's going to feel like there's a lot going on right now because there is. Later the same month, Bonin and Butts abduct 15-year-old Hollywood youth Donald Ray Hayden near the Gay Community Services Center in LA at 1 in the morning. Donald is strangled, stabbed, sodomized. His body is found the same day by construction workers in a dumpster near the off-ramp of the Ventura Freeway. How traumatizing to find a body like that too. I mean... Two weeks later, in the early morning of September, 17-year-old David Luis Murillo is biking to the movies in La Mirada. 
when Bonin and Butts abduct him, he's found repeatedly sodomized, strangled, and bludgeoned, and his body is found thrown over an embankment into a bed of ivy along the 101 highway. Eight days later, 18-year-old Newport Beach resident Robert Christopher Wirostek is abducted while cycling to his job. His body is found along Interstate 10. Two months after that, November 1st, Bonin and his accomplice Butts abduct and murder an unidentified man approximately 23 years old. The man is beaten and strangled and his body is left in an irrigation ditch along State Route 99 south of Bakersfield. Four weeks after that, Bonin, this time he's alone, he abducts a 17-year-old named Frank Dennis Fox. He suffers extensive blunt force trauma to the head and face with ligature marks on the wrists and ankles. His body is found along the Ortega Highway five miles east of San Juan Capistrano. It's now December 1979 and a 15-year-old Long Beach youth named John Frederick Kilpatrick disappears after leaving his home. He's strangled to death and his body discarded in a remote area of Rialto. Then on January 1st, 1980, Bonin beats and strangles a 16-year-old named Michael Francis McDonald. His body is fully clothed and found along Highway 71 two days after he is murdered. He just has this insatiable, unstoppable desire to do this to these children. Um, the next month, in February 1980, Bonin drives around with his other accomplice, Miley, this time, with the intention of committing another murder. And in the early morning, they pick up 15-year-old Charles Miranda in West Hollywood outside the Starwood nightclub where he's hitchhiking on Santa Monica Boulevard. They drive to an abandoned lot where Bonin has consensual sex with Charles at first, but then Bonin whispers to Miley, kid's gonna die. Charles is overtaken. They steal $6 from his wallet. Bonin rapes him. Miley tries to rape him, but he can't get hard, which pisses him off, so he takes blunt objects and inserts them instead. They both beat him, then strangle him to death with his own t-shirt, and a jack handle twisting it like a corkscrew. They drive the body downtown near East 2nd Street and dispose of it in an alley. And that's where Bonin turns to Miley and says, I'm horny again. Let's go and do another one. Sorry, it's hard to even read that sentence. Um, and then they drive to Huntington Beach looking for their next prey. And that's where they find 12-year-old James McCabe, who's on his way to Disneyland. Oh my god. That makes it worse. Um, they invite him into the van where Bonin sodomized him, beat him, strangled him with his own t-shirt. They take whatever cash is in James's wallet and they leave the body next to a dumpster in the city of Walnut where it's found a few days later. This whole time, Bonin is on parole, by the way. And on February 4th, Bonin is arrested for violating the conditions of his parole and he's remanded in custody at the Orange County Jail until March 4th. But guess what? They let him go. Because only 10 days after being released from custody, 19-year-old Ronald Gaitland is picked up by Bonin and Van Nuys around 8.30 p.m. He's sodomized, strangled, beaten with an ice pick inserted into his right ear. He's found the next day in Duarte near the, t the 210 and 604 freeways. A week after that, on March 21st, Bonin comes across a 14-year-old named Glenn Barker who's hitchhiking to school. Did I mention don't hitchhike ever, please? Glenn is raped, he's beaten, he's strangled to death, and he also has burn marks on his body from a cigarette. Then at 4 p.m. the same day, the same day, the same day again. This is the second time he's doing two in one day. 15-year-old Russell Rock is taken from a bus stop in Garden Grove. He's beaten and strangled to death after being held captive for about eight hours, which is very Burdella. Remember, Burdella was keeping them captive for like 24 hours and sometimes for weeks. Like, imagine just be the hours ticking by. So horrible. I mean, so much worse. Bonin discards of both Glenn and Russell at the same time because he did two in one day. So he gets rid of both of them in a Cleveland National Forest. The bodies are found on March 23rd. So, okay, remember Bonin was at that house party at the beginning of the podcast, at the beginning of this episode, it's March 1980 at that time, and he drives home with that teenage boy. So, that teenage boy uh, was w William Ray Pug, and he is 17 years old. So, he survives, as you remember, only because Bonin says that people saw them together at the party, but he confessed in the van what he likes to do, and that he wants to bring Pug into his web of murder as an accomplice. 
like my question is how do you go from like hey do you want to have sex to oh uh you don't oh that's okay but by the way just so we're on the same page i like to abduct and rape and uh murder boys so does that sound like something you would want to join me in doing like and also pug is not gay right so how mentally deranged like so there would be no i guess what what i'm saying is there would be no sexual satisfaction however twisted that would be also so like how mentally deranged do you have to be as a person like how how malleable and like distorted must your brain and worldview be that you can just some man can just come up to you one day and be like hey i like to abduct and sodomize and kill boys want to join me and you're like ah, that sounds like a good idea I just, I, I can't even, I don't even know what that, what that, why? How does that happen? I don't know. Um, anyway, because uh, on March 24th, Bonin and Pug, they abduct a 15-year-old runaway named Harry Todd. He left the boy's home four days before, and he meets these assholes. So the pair lure the boy into the van with the promise of $20 for sex. They bind him, they sodomize him, they bite him, uh, and... Bonin orders Pug to beat the boy. Then he's strangled to death with his own t-shirt and they leave the body in a rear delivery door to an LA business. Then on April 10th, 1980, Bonin abducts a 16-year-old named Stephen John Wood walking to school. His body is found in an alley in Long Beach close to the Pacific Coast Highway. He's beaten, sodomized, and strangled to death. Bonin and Butts lure a 19-year-old supermarket employee into the van on the pretext of selling him drugs. Darren Kendrick is driven to Bonin's apartment where he's overpowered by the two men. He's beaten, sodomized, and forced to drink hydrochloric acid. Then they kill him with an ice pick to the ear, severing his spinal cord. The body is left behind a warehouse with the pick still in his ear. On May 12th, Bonin abducts and murders a 17-year-old named Lawrence Sharp. This one is a bit different since Bonin was already acquainted with Lawrence. Apparently, he woke up one morning, he, got, he was just sick of seeing Lawrence around, and he thought, hey, I'm going to get rid of him. So he kills him like he kills the other ones, and he leaves the body behind a gas station. Then a week later, Bonin asks his buddy Butts to come over to do more killings. Butts, by this point, is kind of like, dude, you're, you're fucked. Like, no. So Bonin goes alone. He, he abducts a 14-year-old named Sean King from a bus stop in Downey, and he kills him. Later, Bonin would return to Butts and brag about the murder. Like, how do you think that your murders aren't going to come out? You've brought so many people into the fold, and they know everything. They know who you are. They know they've watched you do it. They've participated in it. Don't you think this is all going to blow up in your face one day? Nine days later, Bonin meets a homeless 18-year-old named James Michael Monroe. His family had kicked him out of the house, and he had been living on the streets for weeks. Bonin invites him to stay with him at his apartment, and Monroe agrees. Monroe and Bonin start a sexual relationship, even though Monroe preferred women. So again, I don't... What is Bonin saying to these people? How charismatic can you be that you're, they're now switching sexualities for you? Like, he wasn't, he wasn't into guys, but okay, I'll have sex with you, because you talked me into it. I don't... He must have been on the spectrum somewhere, that infamous spectrum we keep talking about um anyway bonin gets him a job at his delivery place he works at so actually maybe monroe felt like he owed bonin for letting him stay at his house and getting him a job that's actually probably what it was it's like okay i will do sex things with you because i owe you for helping me out so then bonin because now these two are basically like buddies now. Like, they do sex things, he got him a job, they live under the same roof, whatever. They're like buddies. So Bonin tells Monroe that he, want, that he wants to abduct, rape, and kill hitchhikers. So, I don't know how, again, that Monroe is like, I guess so, why not? Because maybe he's thankful for a roof and a job, so he's like, okay, I guess we'll go rape and murder people now. I mean, if you have a job, maybe you can get your own place. Instead of doing that in early 1980, the freeway killer murders were getting a lot of media attention and gay rights activists post a $50,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest of the perpetrators. Bonin, of course, is such a narcissist that he's collecting all of the newspaper clippings for his of his own manhunt. So at this time, a task force is also created with investigators from various jurisdictions where victims are found or abducted from. 
And at the time, the freeway killer was striking at an average of once every two weeks. I know it feels like a lot more because I ran through each and every one of them, but once every two weeks is a lot. Also at this time, Bonin's little helper pug is arrested for auto theft. Uh Uh-oh, the beginning of the end. He goes to Juvie where he overhears on the radio the MO of the ongoing freeway murders, which he recognizes as his pal Bonin. Pug tells a counselor about it, who in turn tells the police. The police go to Pug for an extensive interview. Pug doesn't mention that he was actually there doing a few of the murders, but he gives police enough information so they believe Bonin is the freeway killer. Uh, McVicker, who you remember is Bonin's first victim in the attempted murder in the desert, um, had also come forward with his suspicions that Bonin was the freeway killer, but the police never got to that tip in time, of course. They were inundated with, you know, calls and stuff. But the police do an extensive background check on Bonin, and they find, of course, his convictions for sexual assault of teenage boys. So they organize a surveillance team to monitor Bonin's movements, and they start on June 2nd, 1980. The same day that they start the surveillance. I mean, obviously, it's the day that they started the surveillance, but they weren't following him yet because Bonin and his new partner in crime, Monroe, they meet 18-year-old print shop worker named Stephen Wells at a bus stop in El Segundo. So don't hitchhike and don't take the bus in Southern California are probably two rules of thumb. He's at a bus stop on El Segundo Boulevard. They somehow entice him into the van. They learn that he's bisexual and they convince him to go to Bonin's apartment with the promise of $200 to be bound up for sex. So he agrees at the apartment. He's allowed, he allows himself to be bound, but then of course it all goes to shit. He's raped, he's beat, and they even tell him that he's going to die before they do it. And then they strangle him with his own t-shirt. They leave the body behind a disused gas station in Huntington Beach. Okay, on June 11th, 1980, nine days after the surveillance started, Bonin is driving to Hollywood. Little does he know that he's being tailed by investigators who see him talking to five different young men standing on street corners before they finally get one. That one is 15-year-old Harold Tate, and he gets in the van. The van drives to a vacant lot on Santa Monica Boulevard near the Hollywood Freeway, Investigators close in. They hear banging and screaming from inside the van. The plainclothes officers force their way into the van and they apprehend Bonin in the act of sodomizing Harold. Like, couldn't they have gotten there before? Like, they were probably creeping up on the van slowly. Like, okay, no, run, run. Like, he kills, he rapes and kills people. Run. God, like they gave him enough time to like bind the guy, beat him up a little bit, pull down his, like rape him. Like, just like, just get to the kid. Okay. Harold, of course, was handcuffed and he was bound and they find white nylon rope and three knives in the van. So, of course, Bonin is taken into custody. He's charged with the rape of a minor and on suspicion of the murder of Charles Miranda, who was the victim that they picked up in West Hollywood outside the club. You remember. The next day, Monroe steals Bonin's car. So Monroe was like, what the fuck? I'm getting out of here. He steals not the van. He steals, there was a car as well, and flees to Michigan. Yeah, because they're not going to find you there. Inside the van, which is in custody, they find bloodstains throughout, tons of weapons and restraining devices and newspaper clippings of the murders in the glove compartment. I love that he kept them in the glove compartment. Like It's almost like when he was parked... Sometimes he just needed a boost of, like, narcissism, so he would just open the glove compartment and read his own articles. Ugh, why keep them with you around? That's so weird. All right, so as for the confession, so first Bonin says that he's innocent on all charges, but that doesn't last long. Uh, One of the mothers of the victims writes him an impassioned letter begging him to tell her where the location of her son's body was. So when he reads that letter, he actually breaks down, not crying, but he confesses, because this guy is not remorseful, 0% remorse with this guy. But he breaks down in the sense that he confesses to 21 cases of abducting, raping, and killing young boys and men. He doesn't express any remorse, as I just said, uh, for what he's done. He's just embarrassed about getting caught. But again, if you didn't want to get caught, why did you have like 20 accomplices helping you? So stupid. He obviously doesn't want to go uh, down alone, so he tells the police that his main accomplice is Butts, with Miley and Monroe also helping him from time to time. When asked what he would be doing if he hadn't been caught, he simply says, quote, 
I'd still be killing. I couldn't stop killing. It got easier with each one we did. Bonin was quickly linked to lots of the murders through blood, semen, carpet fibers from the back of the van, and hair that matched his perfectly. On top of the murder indictments, Bonin gets counts of robbery, counts of sodomy, one count of mayhem, which I actually had to Google. Mayhem is a common law criminal offense consisting of the intentional maiming of another person. So now you know. He gets assigned an attorney named Earl Hansen, who stays with him until October 81, at which point Bonin's request he's changed for William Charvette and Tracy Stewart. Because Bonin... So because Bonin throws butts under the bus, police get a warrant to search his place and they find evidence there linking him to several of the murders. So in a press statement, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department says, quote, Bonin and Butts are believed to be responsible for the kidnapping, torture and murder of at least 21 young males between May 1979 and June 1980. Butts claims innocence, saying he only went along with Bonin a few times in a limited role for the torture, but actively participated in the sexual abuse of several. He tells them that he was usually the driver, driving, ra- driving around aimlessly while Bonin abused them in the back. Butts tells investigators the amount of trauma depended on how much the victim resisted his sexual advances. This goes back to this whole like narcissism and this whole people saying no. Um, And that's why, you know, people like Stephen Port were drugging his victims to the point of unconsciousness so that they can't refuse their advances and there would be no rejection. And so I guess in this case, you know, Butts is saying, well, if the victims were more willing, then Bonin would be easier on them. Although, you know, to what end? Because he would kill them anyway. So... Butts was brought before Orange County Municipal Court on November 14th, 1980, with his trial scheduled for July 27th, 1981. So remember James Monroe, he stole Bonin's car and he went to Michigan? Well, on July 31st, he's arrested in Port Huron, Michigan, and extradited to California, where he's charged with murder. Obviously, so that didn't last long. On August 22nd, Miley, who's still only 19 years old at this point, is arrested in Texas. He's brought back to California and charged with murder. They found, this is, oh my God, listen to this. So they find Miley after he confessed to the murders in a recorded phone conversation with a friend. So obviously the friend was like in on it with the police. The police knew he was in Texas, but they were like, okay, we need like a little bit more to charge him. And they approached one of his friends and his friend is all like, sure, yeah, I'll record a conversation, whatever. And then so Miley's just bragging about the murders and the friend is recording. That's what friends are for. Um, So at first he pleads innocent, then of course he pleads guilty in 1981. In the preliminary hearings, four days after his formal plea before the judge, Butts commits suicide by hanging himself with a towel in a cell. I hate that. Because like, I just feel like there's no, like he gets the last, it was his decision what happened with his life. And and you know what I mean? It just sucks because he did all of those horrible things and then he commits suicide. This is Butts, not Bonin, by the way. Um... So he hangs himself with a towel in his cell. Investigation reveals that he had actually attempted it four times unsuccessfully prior to his arrest. He left no suicide note. So had they known, they should have had him on suicide watch. Had they known that this guy was like prone to suicide. Um, Before Bonin's trial, his sidekicks, Miley and Monroe, Dumb and Dumber, agree to testify against him at the trials. So obviously they're just like completely flipping They're turning state's witness. They're just like, I want to save my skin. They make a deal where it's like, okay, you won't get the death penalty. We'll only give you life, whatever. Just give us what we need from Bonin. Oh, it's also, we should also note that prior to his suicide, Butts had neither agreed to testify against Bonin or to accept any kind of plea bargain. So, interesting. So there's two trials that happened because the murders were spread out over Los Angeles and Orange County, which are two different jurisdictions. So we start in Los Angeles where Bonin is brought to trial and he's charged with the murder of 12 of his victims whose bodies had been found within the constituency on October 19th, 1981. So he's tried before the Superior Court Judge William McKean. The trial starts November 5th, 1981. The prosecution seeks the death penalty for each count of murder, stating in his opening speech to the jury, quote, we will prove he is the freeway killer, 
as he has bragged to a number of witnesses, will show that he has enjoyed the killings. Not only did he enjoy it and plan to enjoy it, he had an insatiable demand, an insatiable appetite, not only for sodomy, but for killing, end quote. Um, okay, the prosecution asserts that Bonin considered murder a group sport and would typically groom people of a low mentality to participate in many of his murders. For their part, Miley and Monroe, the two stooges, testify against Bonin at his trial. In his testimony on November 17th, Monroe says that after the murder of Stephen Wells, he and Bonin drive to a McDonald's restaurant and buy hamburgers with $10 taken from Wells's wallet. As they eat the burgers at Bonin's home, Bonin laughs and says, thanks, Steve wherever you are. So, no remorse. Miley goes on to describe how, with the victim Charles Miranda, he had heard a, quote, bunch of bones cracking as Bonin had pressed a tire iron against Charles's neck. The kid vomited. I jumped down on him the same way, killing the guy. Testimony was so graphic and brutal at the trials that members of the audience are, they rush out of the courtroom telling reporters outside that the details are, quote, too nauseating. And also hearing it firsthand from the people that committed the, the, the crimes is just like extra bad. Bonin's defense has a strategy. They are challenging the credibility of the prosecution witnesses and to prove that mitigating factors were the root cause of Bonin's behavior. Of course, referring, of course, when they say that they're referring to the extensive physical, sexual and emotional abuse that he had had as a child. They have Dr. David Foster testify to the fact that developmental effects of violence and abuse on children are catastrophic and that Bonin couldn't tell the difference between violence and love. But the prosecution, of course, says that that is bullshit and they bring in a forensic psychiatrist who is an expert in impulse control disorder and sexual sadism disorder who testifies that Bonin's behavior is not consistent with an inability to control his impulses and, in fact, Bonin was a planner and a sexual sadist with antisocial personality disorder. Okay, so get this. This is intense. A Fresno-based reporter named David Lopez waives his immunity under California's S.H.I.E.L.D. law, which I googled, so... That law provides statutory and constitutional protections to journalists seeking to maintain the confidentiality of an unnamed source or unpublished information obtained during news gathering. So basically, Bonin had given interviews to this guy, this Lopez guy, between December 1980 and April 1981 on the basis that Lopez wouldn't broadcast the details of the interview. Lopez sort of waves all that, that, those rights and whatever. So Lopez has confessions. So basically, Lopez has confessions of the killer taken during the course of seven interviews, and he takes the stand for the prosecution. Lopez tells the courts that Bonin told him January 9th that he was, in fact, the freeway killer, that he killed 21 victims aged 12 to 19, and he liked the, quote, sound of kids dying, end quote. Cross-examination reveals that Lopez's testimony is based on recall and not handwritten notes in an attempt to discredit him. In the closing arguments, the prosecution tells the jury to, quote, give him what he has earned. Defense tell the jury not to find Bonin not guilty because obviously he is guilty, but, the, in, but instead they say they should return the, quote, reasonable verdict you can bring, end quote. They're hedging their bets that at least on some of the counts, Bonin would be found not guilty. Also, the defense questioned the credibility of Miley and Monroe since they had turned state's evidence and therefore their toast testimony was tailor-made by and for the police. And he reminded them of Bonin's troubled childhood. So, following the closing arguments, Judge Keene orders the trial rece recessed until January 28th and the jury begin their deliberation. Bring back my girls. On January 6, 1982, the jury convicts Bonin on 10 of the murders for which he's tried and not guilty on a bunch of charges, which is frustrating. But as the verdicts are read, relatives and friends of the victims weep openly. The next day, the defense and prosecution both make their pleas as to the actual sentence. Was he going to get death or was he going to get life imprisonment? The judge is quoted as saying on March 12, 1982, he had a total disregard for the sanctity of human life and a civilized society, sadistic, unbelievably cruel, senseless, and deliberately premeditated, guilty beyond any possible or imaginary doubt. On January 20th, 
1982, mostly due to the fact that under California law, multiple murders and robbery are the minimum standard for death, and all of those are met in this case, Bonin is sentenced to the death penalty. So finally, we get some fucking good news. The judge formally sentences Bonin to death for the 10 murders for which he's convicted on March 12th, describing the murders as, quote, a gross revolting affront to human dignity. Bonin is then remanded to the warden of San Quentin State Prison, which is outside San Francisco, to wait for execution via the gas chamber. Okay, but we're not done. That was just L.A. There's Orange County, too. So now that L.A. is wrapped up, it's down to Orange County on March 21st, 1983, where Bonin is charged with robbery and murder of four other victims found in that jurisdiction. By this time, the publicity of the freeway killer is just all over the place, and the defense argues to move the trial out of Orange County in order to get a jury that's not tainted by the media. The judge is like, fuck you, um, and sets the trial for June 14th. He actually said, fuck you. No, he didn't. I'm kidding. Uh, the prosecution drew the comparison between the way the murders were committed in Orange County and the already convicted crimes of L.A., as well as the carpet fibers and O.C. matching those from L.A. So the prosecution in Orange County kind of has an easier job because they're kind of like, OK, he was already convicted of these exact same type of murders up in L.A. Obviously, this is him down here doing the same thing. It's exactly the same M.O., the same carpet fibers, et cetera, et cetera. Dumb and Dumber take the stand, Miley and Monroe. They testify about accompanying Bonin on each of their Orange County murders, with Monroe telling the jury that Bonin asked him to lie during his testimony in the second trial. Which, how are these men talking? Like, I thought he was in San... Bonin is supposed to be up in San Quentin, and then Miley and Monroe are in custody. Like, when are these having these private conversations? Like, chatting on the phone, like, girl talk, hey, so what's up? Yeah. No, I'm just checking in. Oh my gosh, did you see that new movie? Oh yeah, it's so good. Anyway, hey, listen, when you're on the when you're on the stand, do you mind lying? Like in your testimony, do you mind lying? Like that would really help me out. Yeah, sure, no problem. Like what? When are they chatting? What? When do when do they have a free moment and and to talk about these things? Okay, prosecution tells the jury, quote, one can truly say from the evidence found within the van, it is a virtual death wagon. The defense, of course, says that the MO does not automatically mean proof it's the same person, and they attack the credibility of Monroe, and they say Bonin is a scapegoat for the four unsolved murders in the OC. Okay, it's him. Come on. Not surprisingly, the jury announces on August 2nd, 1983, they find Bonin guilty on all charges, and after three days of deliberations... As to the penalty, they come back with death on each count, with the judge describing Bonin as sadistic and guilty of, quote, monstrous criminal conduct. So we're on death row now. Bonin is incarcerated on death row for 14 years at San Quentin State Prison, during which time it sounds more like he is at an art retreat than prison, because this asshole gets to paint. He gets to write. He gets to have hobbies. He even wins awards for his artwork, short stories, and poems. I mean, should somebody who's charged with crimes be winning fucking awards? What about the children he murdered? Like, I get smaller crimes. I don't know, like theft or some grand auto theft. And, okay, I'm trying to rehabilitate, so I'm going to write poetry and things. But you're giving awards to this guy? I want an award. He also corresponds with pen pals on the outside, including mothers of some of the victims. If you were a mother of one of the victims, would you? Actually, that's a great question. Let me know at truegaycrime at gmail.com. Would you want to correspond with the person that's convicted with the murder of your child? And if so, why? And what would you say? I'm just curious. I don't think I could, I would want to be in contact with that person. Um, because, well, okay, because listen to this. He never expresses regret or remorse. And on one occasion, Bonin informed a mother that her son had been his favorite victim as, quote, he was such a screamer. See what I mean? Like, think, shit like that happens. The method of Bonin's execution is changed from the gas chamber to lethal injection by the state of California in 1992, following the execution of Robert Alton Harris, who had shown symptoms of discomfort for up to four minutes throughout his 15-minute execution. Who the fuck cares? Good, he's uncomfortable. Oh, my God. So they execute this guy, Robert Harris, and they're giving him um, 
the gas chamber and they're like, oh, he does not look comfortable. How long was he not comfortable for? Four minutes. Four minutes? Well, that, we can't have that. I mean, he's a murderer. He has to be comfortable. What? No. Fucking, what? I don't get that. I get, I get not wanting to torture that. Okay, okay, I'm not into torture. I got it. But some discomfort? You're killing the man anyway. He's sentenced to death. I mean, when they were killing their victims, do you think their victims were given any comfort? Do you think they said, oh, you look uncomfortable. Hold on. Let me take that syringe out of your neck. Let me let me undo the corkscrew t-shirt from your neck. Oh, hold on. Oh, I'll stop raping you with this, with this pool cue. Fuck comfort. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, he had uncomfortable things like convulsions. Anyway, so the state of California opts for lethal injection as an alternate method to execution, branding the gas chamber as, quote, cruel and unusual. Okay, so then there's some appeals. Bonin files a bunch of appeals citing jury prejudice and la la la, lots of other reasons. Each one is unsuccessful. The U.S. Supreme Court is basically like, fuck you, no. You're staying where you are. Bonin is finally executed. God Damn it, this is, I felt like a long road to get here. He's executed by lethal injection inside the gas chamber. So the gas is not on, but that's where they did it. Actually, there's a picture. I, uh, there's going to be a picture on Facebook and Instagram. Another reason to be on the Facebook and Instagram page is because you get all of these images as well of, you know, the victims and of the murderers and, and of the, the houses and the places. And the, there's a picture of this weird, it's the gas chamber. It looks like this weird 1950s submarine looking contraption like like 20,000 leagues under the sea type of thing it's so weird it looks so outdated and old and from a certain time not this time um so february 23rd 1996 14 years after he received his death sentence which again you know how i feel about this if they get the death penalty just kill them like we waste so much time with these appeals and all of the shit i mean just taxpayer money, keeping them in the thing. You've already condemned them to death. Just do it. I'm, I'm, I'm just an efficient person. I like to get stuff done. I like to make lists and check things off a list. So, you know, I'd be like, okay, murder, you know, put bone into death, check. You know, I would, that's something on my list that I would want to scratch off my list if I was in charge, but I'm not. So let's keep going. He's the first person to be executed by lethal injection in the history of California. Less than 24 hours before he dies, he gives an interview to a local radio station. Of course, he gets to do like radio interviews and be a celebrity. He says that he, quote, made peace with the fact that he's about to die. And when asked whether he had, well, has anything else to say to the families of his victims, Bonin stated, quote, they feel my death will bring closure, but that's not the case. They're going to find out. Like, that's what I mean. Like, why are you giving him a platform? He's sentenced to die and you give him a microphone and a platform. The victims' families have suffered enough and now he's like twisting the knife? Okay. At 6 p.m. on the day he's executed, Bonin was moved from his cell to a death watch cell uh, where he's ordered his last meal. Don't get me started on last meals. Um, He gets two large pizzas, three pints of ice cream, and three six-packs of Coke. Three six-packs, that's 18 Cokes. Did he drink 18 Cokes? His final hours are spent in the company of five people he had chosen, including his attorney, a chaplain, and a prospective biographer. At 11.45 p.m., Bonin is escorted from his holding cell into the execution chamber. In his final statement, given to the police warden, he says, quote, I feel the death penalty is not the answer to the problems at hand. I feel it sends the wrong message to the people of this country. Young people act as they see other people acting instead of as people tell them to act. I would advise that when a person has a thought of doing anything serious against the law, that before they did, they should go to a quiet place and think about it seriously. Um, I'm not going to take advice from you. Thanks. None of Bonin's relatives choose to witness his execution. Obviously, they're all embarrassed. Well, embarrassed is not even begin to describe it. But several relatives of his victims are there, and many of whom weep and embrace when the death is finally confirmed. Then Governor Pete Wilson says Bonin says Bonin was the quote poster boy for capital punishment, before adding that California's method of execution ensured his death was infinitely more pleasant than that endured by his victims. Okay, at least there's some awareness there. Bonin is pronounced dead at twelve thirteen AM. 
Yay! He was 49 years old. Okay, so after his death, Bonin's family refuses to claim his remains. They're like, fuck no. (laughs) Throw it out. He's cremated in a private ceremony. No family members are present, and his ashes are thrown into the Pacific Ocean. The ocean's like, fuck, gross. So David McVicker, who is the youth, you know, the one who survived the 1975 assault and who personally witnesses the execution, was initially traumatized by his experience. And in the years immediately following his attack, David had had nightmares. He had dropped out of high school. He began abusing drugs and alcohol. And he described the experience of watching the execution as being symbolic of closure and, quote, the beginning of my life. So there you go. See, it's a good thing. Um, David has been very vocal campaigning to make sure Dumb and Dumber, Miley Monroe, never get out of prison. He says that he was inspired to do this when a mother of one of the victims said to him, quote, you have to speak for my child. That's so sad. Monroe is sentenced to 15 years to life on April 6, 81, and continues to appeal. Monroe has repeatedly been denied parole and is incarcerated at Mule Creek State Prison. His next available parole date is in 2029. Miley was sentenced to 25 years to life on February 5th, 1982. Miley was informed he would need to serve a minimum of 16 years and 8 months before he would be considered for parole. He's later sentenced to a consecutive term of 25 years to life by an Orange County Court judge. And he's also in the Mule Creek State Prison where he's repeatedly violating uh, the prison rules, including possession of drugs. And he attempts to rape a bunch of his fellow inmates. So he is not a model prisoner and he is not going anywhere because on May 25th, 2016 Miley dies of injuries. He gets when he's attacked by another inmate in an exercise. Well, of course, if you're going around trying to rape your fellow prisoners, somebody you're going to try to rape the wrong person and they're going to know people and they're going to fucking kill you in the exercise yard. So he's dead. Uh, Pug, remember him? He's the one that Bonin drove home after the party, and he said the only reason I'm not attacking you is because people saw us together? Okay. He gets six years for voluntary manslaughter on May 17th, 1982. He serves less than four years of that sentence, and he's released from prison in 1985. And so ends the long, torturous, horrifically nauseating and disturbing tale of a monster and his clan of easily manipulated homicidal hangers-on. A couple things I want to talk about are, first of all, the culpability of the weak-minded cohorts. Cohorts. Like, how culpable is somebody? So, and this goes to, like, um, cults. What is the culpability of somebody who is convinced to do something? You know, it wasn't your idea but you act on somebody else's word. So you're equally as culpable. In my mind, what do you think? You do the act, you pay the crime. You do the crime, you do the time. Oh my God. Um, (laughs) I can't believe I just said that. And the other thing is, um, this whole thing about the childhood abuse and, you know, does it lead to murder? Does it make you into a monster? And we saw, well, we see with many, 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 many of these stories. Most of these stories have childhood trauma and abuse in them. So there obviously is a link between what happens when you're that age and then what happens later in life. I did read this interesting uh article though that said you know because throughout Bonin's trials and in the years prior to his execution there was a lot of speculation given to whether the root cause of his crimes lay in his abusive dysfunctional upbringing so the opponents and advocates of the death penalty alike are in agreement that Bonin had endured extensive physical and sexual abuse from childhood Um, but much scorn was given to the claims from his attorneys and supporters that the murders had been a direct manifestation of the abuse that he had endured so, in an article published in the San Francisco Chronicle, Chronicle three days prior to Bonin's execution, the editor, Robert Morse, opened, quote, Bonin was abused as a child. The abuse seems to have been bad, but not nearly as gruesome as the abuse he dealt out. This world is filled with articulate people who can write and paint and were abused as children. Very few of them become serial killers. The crime rate among the mentally ill is lower than among so-called, quote, normal people. 
to call Bonin's evil a psychiatric disorder, as the defense has, or an illness is to slander the mentally ill. And I loved that. That really shows, that really highlights for me a different aspect of this. If we keep talking about mental disorders uh, and then linking them with murders and being, being a serial killer, well, what about all of the people that have mental illnesses that are not serial killers? We're putting them in this box and linking them with these people, and that's not the case. So it, that was an interesting point that he made in the San Francisco Chronicle. That's it for this story, folks. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?